Hi there, welcome to this in-depth video on asthma. This video will cover all the essentials. What is asthma? What is an asthma exacerbation? What is the status of medicus? How do you diagnose asthma? And how do you treat it? We'll cover that and many more in this video. Also made a shorter, more to the point video that covers all the essentials in easy to understand language in just a few minutes. You can find that video in the description. And don't forget to subscribe for more upcoming awesome medical videos. Now you know, before we start, I always do a disclaimer. This video is meant purely informational. This is not medical advice. And if you're looking for medical advice, always contact your doctor. So let's get into it. There are basically two types of asthma, atopic and non-atopic asthma. Atopic asthma is by far the most common cause of asthma, and we will focus on atopic asthma throughout this video. Atopic asthma is caused extrinsically, so by factors outside of your body, which are called stimuli, and those are mostly allergens, like pollen from trees or cigarette smoke. And all those allergens you inhale, and in people with atopic asthma, the lungs are hypersensitive to those allergens, and when you inhale them, you start an inflammation response, and this leads then to systemic IgE release by mast cells. In non-ectopic asthma, it's a bit different, and it's intrinsically. Your body reacts intrinsically, but not on the stimuli from outside. This is very uncommon, but you will also have an uh, inflammation reaction, or it will, be, it will be very local in your lungs, and there will be local IgE release as well. So throughout this video, we will be focusing on atopic asthma, and not at non-ectopic asthma. So then we start with the pathophysiology. Asthma is a chronic inflammation process of your lower respiratory tract, mostly your bronchi and bronchioles in your lungs. And all the immune cells are involved in this process. So your eosinophils, T and B lymphocytes, but also T helper cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and even your mast cells. And what it is, it's a reaction in your airways, which react hypersensitive to certain triggers or stimuli. We already discussed that. This can be cigarette smoke or allergens like dust and pollen. You inhale such a stimuli, it comes in your inner airways and they are ingested by antigen presenting cells. Those take it up and present it to your naive T helper cells or your TH0 cells. Those can then uh, start making interleukins and chemokines and mostly interleukin 4 which leads to the differentiation of your naive T helper cell to TH2 helper cell. And that brings us to the humoral immune response, where your TH2 cells start making certain chemokines and interleukins. First of all, interleukin 4 and 13. And we can see here that it leads to the activation of B cells, which di differentiate in plasma cells, and they start making certain antibodies, mostly IgE. Furthermore, TH2 cells also start producing interleukin-9, which leads to the activation of mast cells, and it starts making interleukin-5, which leads to the increased amounts of eosinophils. Allergens, which you inhale, also bind to the mast cells, and they start releasing the IgE, histamine, prostaglandins, and leukotrins. And this leads to remodeling of your lower airways. And I listed some of the effects here. So it leads to thickening of your basement membrane, also leads to an increased amount of goblet cells and increased activation of those goblet cells. So thicker mucus with more eosinophils, which has an obstructive effect in your lower airways, also leads to uh, increased mast cells in your lamina propria and more histamine release, which leads to more mucus and also contraction of your smooth muscle cells in your bronchioles. And it also leads to more neutrophils and T helper cells in your lamina propria, which increases the inflammation, which also makes the process much more worse. And then lastly, it leads to, to hypertrophy of your smooth muscles in your bronchioles, which leads to increased contractibility and even more obstruction. And this process causes the trias seen in asthma. Airway flow obstruction, which is reversible, bronchial hyper-responsiveness on the allergens and the stimuli, and inflammation all around your lower airways. So that is the pathophysiology of asthma. And this brings us to the signs and symptoms of asthma. Mostly we see wheezing, which is a squeaky breathing. We see shortness of breath, chest tightness, and coughing. And those symptoms are worst in the night or during the early morning and during cold weather. Asthma also has some other associated conditions like GERD, 
rhinosinusitis, sleep apnea, and uh, psychological disorders like anxiety, which is seen in 60 to 52% of all people with asthma, and mood disorders, which are seen 14 to 41% of all people with asthma. When you see a person with a clinical presentation of asthma, you might also think of certain other conditions. In children, asthma might look like allergic rhinitis or sinusitis, viral infections of your respiratory tract like bronchiolitis or RS virus it may look like a foreign body aspiration or like a tracheal stenosis and it may even look like enlarged lymph nodes in the neck which obstruct the airflow or even masses uh, which can be malignant. In adults most commonly it's lo uh, looking like COPD but also it can look like congestive heart failure, airway masses cancer or drug-induced coughing, mostly caused by ACE inhibitors. For diagnosis, most commonly you look at the clinical presentation of a person, look at the signs, its symptoms, and also do your physical examination. And if you think it might be asthma, always do a spirometry. This is best in children and adults uh, older than six years, because below six years uh, it might be technically too difficult for them to perform the spirometry correctly and therefore your results might not be so correct. Also it's still the best test to diagnose asthma and to follow it up in the following years and if you find that somebody has asthma every one to two years you should do a spirometry to see if your symptom gets worse or, or better. So spirometry works as following. If you let someone inhale all the way in the spirometer and all the way out. So as fast as they can and within a few minutes you repeat it but then you let them first use bronchodilatating medication. Typically for asthma patient the first uh, result of the spirometer without medication shows an obstructive pattern and after medication you see a much more uh, normal much more normal pattern which resembles a healthy individual. Both results are compared with a normal individual of the same age you get a percentage of predicted result. The closer it is to 100, the less likely it is that you have asthma. Also, a lot of normal values are calculated. Of them, the most important one is the FEV1, which I have standing here on the slide, which stands for exhale volume in one second of forced expiration. And you compare the FEV1 without bronchodilatating medication with the FEV1 with bronchodilatating medication and if both results show an improvement of more than 12% of, of more than 200 milliliters it's very likely that someone will have asthma. Furthermore there's also a classification to classify if someone has uh, intermittent asthma or even severe persistent asthma and you can make the classification in certain categories so for symptoms if you have less than two times a week uh, asthma attack you have intermittent but if you have it continuously then it's very severe for symptom at night if you have it less than two times a month it's not that severe but if you have it almost every week or, or daily then it's very bad for your forced uh, expiratory volume in one second if it's more than 80% of predicted, so of the normal population, then it's quite good. But the lower it gets, the worse your uh, classification. Also, the variability of your FEV1 is very important. If you inhale a bronchodilatator and you compare your results before and after bronchodilatation and it's changed less than 20%, then you have an intermittent kind. But if it's changed more than 30%, then it's very severe. So the more it changes, the worse your asthma is. And lastly, you compare it with the use of a short-acting beta uh, sympathetic mimetic. So if you need it less than two times a week to uh, alleviate your complaints, then it's not that bad. But the more you use it, the worse your complaints will be. You've also something that is called an asthma exacerbation. This has more or less the same symptoms of somebody who has asthma. So shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, and coughing. But then the symptoms are worse. So you have uh, more breathlessness and therefore the persons also use accessory muscles of respiration, like your sternocleidomastoideus and your scalene muscles. They have a paradoxical pulse and cyanosis, which is uh, turning blue of your extremities, mostly by a low 
oxygen saturation of your blood. And you have certain degrees, you have a mild exacerbation and your peak expiry flow rate, which is tested in spirometry as well, will be more than 200 liters per minute or 50% or more of your predicted best. You have a moderate exacerbation, then you have 80 to 200 liters per minute and 25 to 50 of the predicted best. And in a severe exacerbation, it's even worse. And you have less than 20% of the predicted values. All of that can also be seen in this scheme. So in a moderate acute asthma, you will have increased symptoms of your asthma, but you will also have a peak expiratory flow of 50 to 75% of the best predicted, and there will be no features of acute severe asthma. However, in acute severe asthma, there will be any of these. So your PEF will be 33 to 50% of the predicted, your respiratory rate will be more than 25 per minute, your heartbeat will be more than 110 per minute, or there will be an inability to complete sentences in one breath. So you're very short of breath. Then in life-threatening asthma, we have any of these. So you have these clinical signs, altered conscience level, exhaustion, arrhythmia, hypertension, cyanose, silent chest, or poor respiratory efforts. And uh, these measurements can be done as well. And then lastly, we even have near fatal asthma and then there are increased levels of CO2 in your body or there's a need of mechanical ventilation. So keep that into consideration. You also have something which is called status asthmaticus, which is acute severe asthma that does not react on medication. And it can be caused by two things mostly. 50% of the time it's caused by infections and the other 50% it's caused by allergens, air pollution or inappropriate use or insufficient use of your medication. And when you take your bronchodilatators or your corticosteroids to alleviate your symptoms, it will not work. And this can be very dangerous. And this brings us to treatment of asthma. Treatment of asthma consists out of three steps. Step one, always do lifestyle interventions. They are so important. Do enough exercise, lose weight if you are overweight, and stop smoking if you're smoking and you will see very good results. If you're doing all of that and you still have complaints, then you go to step two, which is better to sympathetic And this is suitable for patients with less than two times a week complaints. And this will help them uh, bronchodilatate and have more air in and out. And this will alleviate their symptoms. However, if this is insufficient and you have more than three times a week complaints, you go to a last step, step three. And this is inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta-2 synthetic mimetics. And you can increase the ICS every time you have insufficient result and you just double the dose till hopefully you have no complaints anymore. So that's in a nutshell the treatment. I used many literatures, but I find it important to know this one. So the ASMI guidelines of 2016 from the BTS. Um, they also helped me with the scheme and a lot of the information. If you want to learn a little bit more, feel free to check them out. They were really helpful for me. Furthermore, I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, ask them in the comment section below. And you know, subscribe for more upcoming awesome videos. I also made other videos on the asthma medications as well, on how to use them. Uh, you can find them in the description or uh, in my video library. Thank you for watching and see you soon. Bye bye.